and uh, happy, oh, autumnal equinox. <laughs> that uh, first day of, first full day of fall, and it is so good to be gathered together uh, to worship this morning. I have to warn you, I have a number of announcements, but that's what happens when we are uh, a busy pastoral charge. Uh, just to let you know that, um, oh, and if you want to keep up with it, the October calendars are out and they're just sitting here in the fellowship hall. Uh, this afternoon at 2 p.m., the uh, young adult group will start meeting up again for the fall, and that is 2 p.m. down at the Embrace Center. And of course, all of our regular programming other than that has already begun, uh, and uh, including uh, the, Bible star, the Bible study at the Embrace Center on Mondays at 1 p.m. Uh, there was uh, a good crowd when I kind of crashed at the very end of it last week, so that was good to see. Also, those who were going to put in a gift card order, it's one of the fundraisers that the youth do here in the church. If you uh, were going to put in an order this month, today is the day, but if you're not ready, don't worry, there are two more opportunities before Christmas. Um, I'm gonna let Rick make an announcement. At the church council meeting this past Wednesday, one of the topics of deliberation was the vacant position of church treasurer after the passing of Valerie Spear. Our current chairman of the finance committee of council, Terry Metcalf, graciously volunteered to take on this position for council. As uh, as he and Valerie had worked so closely together on financial and other administrative matters of the church in the past. This is seen by council as a good transition, which will require little or no training and, or downtime. However, as Terry rightly pointed out to us at the meeting, it would not be a good idea to have our treasurer and our chair of finance be the same person. The council feels that the best option now is to ask from among the congregation and adherents if there would be someone willing to take over the position of financial chair. The committee develops and monitors our annual budget and guides our expenditures throughout the year. The committee meets at least quarterly with the chairperson also attending the church council meetings quarterly. If anyone would like to volunteer or know someone with an interest in or skills associated with financial or business matters, please speak with either myself, Terry, or with Reverend Cheryl or Reverend Bill. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's getting close. Our big bazaar is happening next Saturday. And um, because it's Indigenous Day, I think it would be nice if the workers could uh, wear orange. So if you don't have any orange T-shirt or whatever, uh, I have an extra one. I think it's already taken. Uh, but it would be a nice gesture, I, I believe. Um, there are still some... Um, help needed and there's a sign-up sheet on the hall there if um, any of you are able to fill in a spot there um, and then for those of you who have uh, went out and got some gifts for our, our basket table or um, you know a gift certificate of some kind could you please have it in at the church on Wednesday um, I'll be here in the morning baking um, whatnot, so it would be wonderful if we could get that in so that I, it can get organized. Thank you.
had several requests from people to do a Pampered Chef party for the church as a fundraiser. So we've finally been able to set a date for that. It's going to happen here at the church on November 2nd. We're probably looking at 5 p.m. The time is to be determined, but we just wanted you to save the date. It's a good time to come out, support the church. We'll have some food and maybe start some early Christmas shopping as well. Thank you, and the only other l and last announcement that I have this morning is that uh, Phyllis um, mentioned uh, the orange shirt piece, that there will be a Truth and Reconciliation March here in Fort Erie, but not on the Saturday. It's going to be held on the Friday uh, so that they can include the school children, and it goes from the, the Arch downtown up to the Friendship Center, and that starts at uh, 10 a.m., uh, Reverend Bill, he'll be running in kind of a little bit later. He's preaching somewhere else this morning. But he would like, if there's somebody else going, if they could kind of drop one person's car off at the Friendship Center and then drive down and, you know, just to share cars back and forth. So after the five-kilometer uh, march, he doesn't have to march back down and get his car. So uh, you, can, you can come, uh, you can find him after, after the service. So friends, let us call one another to worship this morning. Come near to the Lord. Lord, be with us this day. Lift your sorrows and joys to the Lord. Lord, we hear the cries of our hearts. Come rest in the love and mercy of God. Bless us, O Lord, that we may be blessings for others in your name. And we're going to begin our time together by standing as you're able and singing for the beauty of the earth, which is a really great hymn for this first day of fall. Friends, please pray with me. God of hope and peace, you are with us in all our days and in all our ways. As you walked with the Israelites in the desert when they had given up hope, you came to them with nourishment and your steadfast love. Just as Jesus walked through Jerusalem, healing the sick and those afflicted, your love was made abundantly clear through acts of love and mercy. 
Lord, we ask that you be with us this day as we gather to hear your word, that you inspire and encourage us in all that we do, that we may serve you faithfully, bringing hope and your message of love to a thirsting world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to uh, invite the, the young'uns to come up and uh, something I want to show them. So we'll just sing our song as they come. for them and God does. So today I brought some bread with me. Now this is not just any bread. I actually bought this when I was on vacation. This is uh, soldier's bread from Lewisburg Fortress and uh, and it weighed, well it's getting lighter because I've had it a while, <laughs> but it weighed about two pounds. It is very dense. And the soldiers would get, uh, twice a week, they would get a four-pound loaf of bread to, uh, to last them. And then it was up to them to supplement with whatever they could find. They tell me that uh, they used to go down and, and try to help out the fishermen so that they could make soup out of the fish heads. Doesn't that sound like really delicious, some fish heads? No? No? <laughs> but, so, um, yeah, this is, no, don't throw it. Okay, you can just lift it. But see how solid that is? And there's not even any mold in it. It's, it's just nice and dried out. <coughs> now, of course, the reason I brought it back because of uh, nobody likes soldier's bread, except for Victoria. So that's why I brought it all the way back, so. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty hard now. I'm going to leave it up here in case any, anybody wants it. In case anybody wants some later. <laughs> but the thing is, even though it's not the most delicious of the breads, or, or the uh, prettiest of the breads, um, it did the trick. And the soldiers ate it, and they were able to, to do their work and keep going, which is kind of like the manna that... Uh, that God sent to the children of Israel, because they were really hungry in the desert, but, uh, but God gave them manna, which I think technically uh, translates to what is it. So we talk about it being bread from heaven, but we don't really, really know quite what it was, uh, and we don't know if it was delicious or just, uh, or just plain, but it was enough to sustain them as they traveled and they found their way. So I think when I look at that bread, and when I think about the story of the children of Israel and, and God giving the manna from heaven, I'm just reminded that God provides for us, but not always in the way that we might want, but in ways that we need. So that's what uh, we're going to be talking about in here today as you folks go out to Sunday school. So you can head on out there now. Thank you. And our psalm for this morning is Psalm 105, and we're going to read parts 1 and 4.
name. Make known to the nations what God has done. Sing, O oh, sing the song's praise. Tell of all of God's wonderful deeds. Exalt in God's holy name. Let those who seek God Turn for help to the one who is your strength. Seek God's presence continually. Remember the marvels the Most High has done, the wonders and judgments God has given. O children of Abraham and Sarah, God's servants. O offspring of Israel, chosen of God. You are the eternal God. Your justice reaches every corner of the earth. You are ever mindful of your covenant, the promise you gave to a thousand generations. The covenant you made with Sarah and Abraham, the oath you gave to Isaac. You confirmed it for Jacob as binding. To Israel, your everlasting covenant you declared. To you I give the land of you led Israel out with the spoil of silver and gold among the tribes not one fell behind the Egyptians were glad when they went for the dread of Israel had fallen upon them you spread a cloud as a screen and fire as light by night the people asked and you sent them quail you filled them with bread from heaven you opened a rock For you remembered the sacred promise you made to Abraham and Sarah, your servants. You led out your people rejoicing, your chosen ones to songs of gladness. You gave them the lands of nations. They took possession where others had toiled, that they might keep your laws and obey your teaching. We continue to revisit some of the stories from the Exodus, and this week we hear two stories of how God provided for the people. First is from chapter 16, where God provides bread and quails for the people to eat, and the second is from chapter 17, where God provides water from a rock. This is a reading from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 to 15, and chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, 
In the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the, meat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, Thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Hear what God is saying to the church through these scriptures today. I'm going to invite you once again to stand as, as you're able and uh, let's sing together hymn number 274, Your Hand, O God, Has Guided.
Thank you, choir. So this uh, season, we are doing an abbreviated overview of the story of Moses. And in the last, uh, well, over the last little while, Reverend Bill has brought us from the voice of God speaking to Moses through a burning bush in the desert, through the, the great escape to the crossing and crossing of the Red Sea that we talked about last week. And now, the story kind of turns to, to the wandering years. Those stories of how the children of Israel, they adjust to a nomadic life and become more of a community. And they have to be able to have that time to, to adjust, to, to um, become a community before they are able to become a settled nation. And this morning, as you heard from our readings, we're going to kind of roll two of those stories in together. Uh, and they, those two stories, they kind of, uh, they center around the need for food and the need for water. And the fear that comes from the scarcity of resources. Fear that, that sometimes impedes our ability to trust in God. Let us pray. Gracious God, who provides us with every good thing, provide for us deeper understanding this morning as we engage these sacred stories. Open our hearts and our ears to hear you speak. Amen. So earlier this week, I was chatting with someone uh, in, uh, in NA, in Narcotics Anonymous Recovery Program, and the and the person I was talking to, they're, they're still fairly new in discovering what wonderful potential their life has now that it's uh, becoming freer and freer from addiction. And this person, they talked with me about the importance of being around folks who have walked and who are walking uh, a similar journey with them, or, or as they are, I should say. Because without that inspiration of, of knowing what other folks have, have walked and that other folks have had healing experiences, successful healing experiences, they said without that, it is very difficult to see beyond the slavery of that addiction. And as we had this conversation, we also talked about the, the wilderness experience of the Israelites after that, that miracle experience of crossing the Red Sea. It was a great miracle, but now freedom came down to the day after day after day after day process of living in their post-Egyptian slavery world. And the adjustment turned out to be much harder than they had expected. Now, of course, it was good to be away from the, the brutality of the slave masters, but now they had moved in, into this unknown. And in some ways, the fear of the unknown was greater than the fear of being broken and beaten by an unjust system. There is a very weird sense of comfortable in the familiar, even even when it's killing you. Trust becomes a very complex issue. And the children of Israel, they have experienced generations of trauma. And they have little capacity to trust in leadership to, to do what's best for them or to have their best, uh, their, their needs put before anyone else's. They, they have no experience of that. And I can almost see them, as I read these passages, I can almost see them giving up and some of them wanting to just make their way back to the brutality of Egypt. Except, except God wasn't going to give up on them. God had no intention of showing them freedom only to abandon it them in the wilderness. They had needs, and they were afraid, and God was going to provide, and, and we know the story, right? The people are hungry, 
So God provides manna in the morning and quail in the evening. You know, one of the uh, VBS songs from last year, uh, last year we did the, the food truck party, and it was called Manna in the Morning. And it, uh, we've been playing it at home, so it's kind of in my head. But you have to imagine a Calypso beat to it, right? So it's like, what do you have for lunch today? Manna, M-A-N-A, manna, mmm, yum. Is that Calypso beat? <laughs> How about, you know, hey, that sounds nice. What about dinner tonight? Quail, Q-U-A-L, you know, manna. Anyways, the kids like to sing it again and again and again. So that week it was definitely in your head. Or as one little guy called it, the banana and, and snail song. So manna and quail, banana and snails. Didn't matter to him. He just knew it was a story about God providing some unusual food to hungry people. So what starts out as a story about fear becomes a story about celebration of having enough or die in you, as we sang last Sunday. And that song goes, if our God has simply saved us, and we can fill in any part of the story there, it would have been enough. And it would have been enough. Except that God goes beyond again and again, taking us another step forward again and again, if only we trust. And the story of the manna and quail moves pretty quickly into another story about scarcity, and this time a scarcity of water. The water supply is low, and, and God tells Moses to, to go out to a rock mound near, uh, near Mount Horeb and to strike it with his staff. And from the walk, from the rock, a stream of water will flow forth. And he does this, he goes out, he strikes a rock, and the water flows forth. Now this probably sounds strange, but you have to remember that Moses spent years in the desert when he was working for his father-in-law, and he would have known about underwater, uh, um, underground water sources, and they're usually found by striking rocks and listening for hollow sounds. But even knowing that, friends, even knowing that, here we have God leading Moses to just the right rock to strike. Another miracle. And again, we hear that the story goes from one of fear and anger, because, uh, you know, the people at this point have actually uh, threatened to stone Moses. So it goes from fear and anger to another story of celebration because God has provided. And you know, when when you're younger and you're hearing these stories and you wonder, like, what in the world is wrong with these people? I mean, God has per, uh, performed a series of miracles and wondrous signs, and yet all they do is grumble and complain. They just get angry. They're mistrustful. It just doesn't make sense. Unless, of course, you're talking about actual people and the ways that people act and react to stress and trauma. And we all have stressful and even traumatic events that happen in our lives. And some folks will have a much harder life than others. Nobody's life is easy. And none of us fully know the paths that others have walked. That's part of why we, we always must be kind. But some of us who have walked stress and traumatic paths have had the grace of time to integrate those changes imposed into our lives. Integration is part of the healing process because it takes time to settle into a new reality. Even when it's a better reality, it still takes time. The dust has to settle and give the opportunity for that wider perspective. Now for the Israelites, they have moved from slavery into one crisis after another after another, and the dust has not settled from one crisis before they have uh, found themselves in the next that flares up. And in that space, they can only see narrowly what is in front of them. They have not yet learned to look up and to see that wider perspective. 
to be able to see how far it is that they have traveled from their old life. Because once God settles the dust and takes care of the immediate needs, you're able to lift your head and you're able to recognize grace. You catch your breath and you see where you are and you see where it is you've come from and you see where it is you are going to and you can see God's hand at work all along the way. (coughs) You integrate into that new reality and you recognize God's grace. And when you can recognize God's grace, you can understand hope as well. And we all need, we all need hope. That, that holy hope of something that is just beyond the horizon waiting for us. For the Israelites in the desert, their hope would be realized in a homeland, not for them, but for their children. They themselves would never live in the promised land, but their children would experience a better life. And our better life uh, probably won't include a land of milk and honey, or for a number of us, even, you know, expensive retirement community. Our better life is found in everyday moments of grace. (laughs) Like when you get to hug a grandchild you haven't seen for a while. When you get a text from a friend that says they're praying for you. When a sibling trusts us with, with hard news. When you have enough money to pay the bills, when, when you can see the, a bouquet of, of wildflowers on your kitchen table catching the light just right. When you hear folks sitting uh, at another table at Tim Hortons and they're laughing so hard that everybody in the whole place is smiling and joining into their joy. When you sing a beloved hymn and suddenly it feels like a hug from Jesus. We experience uh, glimpses of hope. We experience hope through those everyday moments of grace. And friends, that is a good life. Because we don't have to be stuck in the things that enslave us in this world. And we don't want others to be stuck either. Because once we have have experienced the hope once we have seen the grace, we want others also to know about that freedom that we have found. It's like that old story where, where Buddy gets stuck in a pit and, and uh, can't get out, and this woman jumps in down beside him, and he thinks, oh, no, now we're both going to be stuck. But instead she says, don't worry. I've been here, and I'll show you how to get out. When we say, let my healing be inspiration for your healing. Let me tell you about the hope I know, the grace I have received. Let me tell you about my God. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Now for us as a congregation, we're going to step away from the lectionary stories of the children of Israel for, for most of next month, actually. Next week is uh, Worldwide Communion Sunday, and we're going to celebrate that. And then it's Thanksgiving, and we're going to celebrate that. And then it's World Food Sunday, uh, for which um, I'll be away. Um, But by the time we get back to the lectionary at the end of the month, we'll have missed a lot of the other stories, and we'll talk about Moses' death and Joshua leading the Israelites into to settle as a nation. But that's okay, because we know the stories, right? And ultimately, the whole story of Exodus is a story of learning to trust in God to provide. And that continues to be such an important message and lesson for the church. We aren't going to have manna fall into our laps. And and even if we did, you know how the story goes, even with the manna, we still need to get out there and gather it up day after day after day. We work hard and God provides. God provides and we go out to gather. 
that's the reality of the Christian life. And my prayer for us here is that we gracefully gather together. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we're going to sing together hymn number 460, All Who Hunger. <coughs> we do every week, we have the opportunity to give back to God of our gifts and our offerings. And I'll ask the, the usher to please bring those forward. Please pray with me. Generous God, you have blessed us with so much. Take these gifts and cause them to work for you in this world, which you have won to us. Amen. Amen.
Gracious God, another month of Sundays has come to an end, and we are thankful for the successes you have brought with the reopening of all this congregation's ministry endeavors. We have adjusted to familiar routines, and we thank you for helpful and life-giving practices that give shape to our lives. In our everyday, give us eyes to see your moments of grace and give us courage to share that grace with others. Because you have loved us, we move beyond the sanctuary doors to love others. Lord, and we are thankful for this community. And we pray that you be with the UCW this week as they prepare for the Fall Bazaar. Such an event takes a lot of people covering many responsibilities to make it work. And they do these tasks with practiced hands and joyful hearts. They serve as an example to all of us, knowing that fun is an important part of the life of a community. The true community is built when folks enjoy one another and seek to get to know each other better. We share the good times, and when we do that, it's easier to reach out when the hard times come. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that there is sorrow and sickness in our world. May we bring hope to that world as we pray for its healing. And this morning, oh God, we particularly take time to pray for those who have been affected by violence. We pray for the family of the, the Mountie who was killed out in British Columbia. Not the first this year of, of folks who have put their life forward to protect the rest of us. And we pray for safer streets safer streets in Toronto and in Niagara Falls and so close to our own communities, but also, Lord, around the world. We pray for the children who are living in the tension of violence and what it's doing to their sense of self and their mental health. And we pray, O oh God, that as a society, we can do better. We pray, O oh God, for, for those who are close to us. And we hold before you those names who, of those who weigh on our hearts. This morning we bring forward the names of Sandra and Audrey, Micah and Leanne, Roberta and Lori and Shirley. And we add to those names a multitude of names that have not been spoken aloud, but who are prayed for silently and just as reverently. God, as we put behind us another summer and we move into another fall, we are thankful to be your people. And we ask that you use us in all the ways that folks need. And we pray this all in Jesus' name as together we sing.
So friends, for our final uh, hymn together this morning, uh, it's going to sound familiar because we've been using one of the verses for our gathering song um, since, uh, since we came back in September. And we thought it's such a great hymn. Let's sing the whole thing. So I'd invite you to stand again and sing together 556, Would You Bless Our Homes and Family. Let us bless each other by sharing in our benediction. You have been called to serve the Lord with gladness. Go from this place knowing that God's blessings have been poured on you so that you may be a blessing to others. Amen. Thank you.